Welcome to the show. Got some big news here in Tennessee. I don't know if you saw this yesterday. Governor Bill Lee, he's on TV. I used to live out in Southern California. I used to love this place, In-N-Out Burger. We're getting one here. By 2026, we're going to have an In-N-Out Burger headquarters right here in Tennessee. They got some of the best company trucks in the road. And you know, in California, they banned all those like 2010 and older trucks. So hey, bring that hot, beautiful fleet right down here to Tennessee. I'm looking forward to it. And that is if you still have an appetite after the pit in the stomach you had this morning when we all heard the FAA was shut down for like two hours. Was that like the first time since 9-11 every single plane was grounded in the U.S.? Fortunately, they got that back up. We don't anticipate a ton of cargo disruptions, but really uh, curious and maybe a little awkward for Sec Pete over there. He just got done censuring Southwest about their problems with technology. Meanwhile, look what just happened with the FAAA. A lot of systems outdated. Here's another disruption, by the way, to all the people online who are like, hey, I'm a I love trains. Why don't you just take the train? Well, here's a tweet from Sam Sweeney. He says, breaking, a travel nightmare is unfolding right now in Amtrak. Passengers on the auto train have been stuck on board for 29 hours, currently sitting in the woods in rural South Carolina. Passengers call the local police saying they're being held hostage. This could be like the plot of the director is going to be on in just a minute. Here's next movie. Uh, fortunately, after 37 hours and a pizza delivery and a tra their train uh, arrived from uh, Savannah, Anna, Georgia. So finally, these people got off this thing. Sounds like an awful nightmare. I don't know. Ominous, ominous year. And also, folks, this is why the word disruption is absolutely the worst term in, in freight marketing. Don't use it. We don't want things disrupted here. Enhance, help, assist. On today's show, Candyland director John Schwab will go deep inside the mind of the man who made the latest Truck Stop Slasher movie. We're going to talk about that system crash more with Rachel Premack. She's also talking about supply chain finance transparency. We got T-Force Worldwide's Chris Steele to talk about the intersection of tech and relationships. Rooster and Super Trucker are going to round things up with uh, news of the weird and a little focus on Human Trafficking Awareness Initiative. I believe Human Trafficking Awareness Day is actually today. So let's tip the band and we'll get into things. Did you know that AIT publishes a global transportation market report every single month? So if your business needs information about air and ocean trends, carrier updates, economic forecasts, North American trucking and customs clearance news, you can get all that and more in an easy to digest overview. Best of all, it's free to download. The next edition already came out. It was on December 7th. Go to AITWorldwide.com and get yourself a copy. Now, I wrote about this in the newsletter. I gave you a review of it on Friday, but I haven't actually showed you the full trailer for this. So let's play the trailer and then we'll bring the director up. I know what it is you do. There is still time for you. We'll show you the way to the kingdom of heaven. Repent or you will be left for the final cleansing. <laughs> what are you doing back here? Are you okay? Who's this? She's from that weirdo cult. I think they're gonna leave for heaven before the rest of us. Was that your mother? Yeah. What happened to her? You don't want to call this kind of thing in. It just creates more problems. Now we just gotta clean it up. Are you gonna go home? You can't go home. We have a rule. You stay, you work. But if you work, we take care of you. Because it's rough out there. You good, buddy? Sure I am. Looking for a little fun. Your mind has been poisoned. And I know it is not your fault. You are so beautiful. Oh, you don't have to be scared. I couldn't hurt a fly. Folks, Candyland is out now on video on demand, and here he is right now, the director, John Swab of Candyland. Thanks, John, for joining us today. Dooner, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. You know, I um, I look for movies all of the time. Uh, I'm always checking, like, the recent discoveries, the new releases on Apple Movies, and I saw the promo 
for Candyland. And uh, my inner Joe Bob Briggs and my inner Space Ghost were both tickled. I was like, Freight needs another movie. You know, once in a while, like a positive trucking spin. We haven't had that in a while, but I'll take like a good B cult movie. Beggars can't be choosers. And you know what? I think he kind of knocked it out of the park with this one. Where'd you get the idea? Uh, I've always been fascinated with, um, you know, subcultures and, uh, and I know a few lot lizards and their story to me is always fascinating when I get to talk to them and hear, you know, what their life's like. Um, I, you know, I don't know. It just, na it, so it seemed like a natural setting for a horror movie. Um, you know, a lone truck stop on the road and, and kind of these lot lizards in their lives. So. Hey, where do you think, so this was a question that came up when I was talking to a couple of truckers that work for me. What, what movies do you think are better? Were the, the truck drivers, the villain or the truck drivers, the good guy? I, I personally like, uh, I don't know. I like them all, man. But I, I, you know, for, for your all's sake, I'd say when they're the good guy. All right. I, I like, cause I, I like, you know, I like Lincoln Hawk and over the top, but I also like candy cane, you know, rusty nail in joyride. I, I love Hard candy cane. Oh yep, yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So let me ask you this. So you mentioned that you did some research, um, you know, some truck stop sex workers. How, how long have you, like, what kind of research did you do into that lifestyle? And what kind of considerations did you put in when you were casting the girls who play these parts? Um, well, my, my former life was as a, uh, as a uh, meth, crack, and heroin addict. Oh, wow. uh, so, you know, I would shack up with uh, a few lizards now and then. And uh, so I got to know them, you know, on a personal level outside of their work. Um, and I don't know, I got a feel for them as human beings, not just as, you know, uh, these, these, you know, sex workers or, or you know, um, kind of you know, cast off to society and I had a lot of empathy for them. So, um, I guess that, that was kind of my research. And then when it came time to cast the, 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 you know, the actors, it was just important to me that they felt like real people and not like caricatures, um, so that the audience would have empathy for them and relate to them, you know? You know, I love the opening of the movie because, you know, it, you can almost tell like within the first minute if a movie's going to at least be like watchable, right? And I love the sort of soft filming you have. It, it had a very 70s style, that opening. And I love also that it was set in 1996. That was when I was a teenager and it opened up with Porno for Pyro's Pets. That was a great lead song. How'd you pick that one? Uh, well, my producer, um, who I make these movies with, uh, we're both big music freaks and it's it's super important to us you know, the, the music we put in our films. Um, he represents Dave Navarro, um, who obviously has a close connection uh, through Jane's Addiction to uh, Perry Farrell, who's the lead singer of Porno for Pyros and Jane's Addiction. Um, so we kind of looked to our resources and, you know, it just seemed like a no brainer, um, you know, to set this film in a time and place. And, and speaking of setting, you know, if you're doing a truck stop and you got to kind of nail it, right? And I thought you guys did a great job. But what was that, the mountains in the background? Am I looking at Montana? Where, where did you pick the location? How'd you pick it? Yeah, that's uh, Livingston, Montana. That's the immigrant peaks right behind it. And, um, you know, I'd never been there. We kind of happened upon uh, that, that particular truck stop. And once we saw it, we knew this is, this is the movie. This is Candyland. So it was, it was just sheer luck, really. The one disconcerting thing I found, although now I kind of like it because I can throw this movie back in the face of like the Die Hard is a Christmas movie people. Why did you pick Christmas as a backdrop? Because there's like multiple, not only is there people dressed in Christmas attire, but like there's Christmas songs on the soundtrack. I wrote the movie over Christmas break a few years ago, um, and I, I think I finished the script on Christmas Day. So it was just kind of in my bones as I was writing it. And then it also just seemed like one extra cherry uh, to throw on top of this thing um, to make it even more ridiculous and, and fun. This isn't your first rodeo either. One of your first films, or maybe even your first film, was Let Me Make You a Martyr. And I was looking through the cast on there, and I noticed Marilyn Manson. What was it like directing Marilyn Manson? Um, well, Manson's uh, become a dear friend of mine, and... Uh, and was a, was a childhood hero of mine. So getting to direct him was like pretty surreal. Um, so it was kind of a, a weird dream come true, a dream I never really had to have him in a movie um, that just ended up happening. So it was, um, it was a real treat. It was a pretty special experience to, to get to work with him and, and to continue to know the guy and learn from him. So Who is, who is easier to uh, keep in line on set? Was it Manson or was it Billy Baldwin? Um, that's a tough question. 
Uh, they're both they're both strange dudes. Uh, I'd, I'd probably give the edge to Manson. I loved Billy. How did Billy Baldwin hang get, uh, end up in this film? How, why'd you why'd you pick him for that part? I thought he did a great job too. Um, we we always love to kind of to to reach back and grab people that you know we love that maybe you know um, haven't had shine in a while, and uh, he had appeared in a series called too old to die young and he was uh, about as creepy as could be and uh my producer who's also the casting director loved that series and said please check out billy in this series um so i did and uh and i was like jesus i mean this guy is as freaky as it gets so um you know just it that's that's kind of how it all happened and, and billy was game so we love billy wow hey you know you you, you mentioned earlier that this, you're kind of inspired by turning your own life around myself. I've been through uh, rehab, dealt with alcoholism, and um, so I, I, I kind of understand your story there. How did you decide to get yourself back on track to start making films and point your life in, uh, in this direction? Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the movie I made, Let Me Make Your Martyr, I was actually, uh, I was still using then pretty heavily, and that was kind of around my bottom. And after that experience, um, you know, life got, about as bad as it's gotten for me and you know it was either die uh stay the course and die or change course and live and you know i kind of used you know my uh creative aspirations and movies as a life preserver um so you know i kind of jumped in with both feet i met jeremy uh my producer on the last ever since met martyr and uh we've kind of just been you know we've become best friends and and you know uh counterparts to each other and uh support systems so you know ever i mean i've kind of used movies uh, to climb out of the you know the, the depths of addition you know not to mention you know uh 12 step programs have, have you know helped me out a lot too so you know well, hey, man, a little cowbell for that. I, I, I love the story. Um, you know, an interesting, a big thematic in that movie, too, is religion, right? And how did, why did you decide to bundle those two? Is it just like sort of the dichotomy of the sort of heathenist lot lizard versus the sort of virtuous cult? Or where did that all come from? Uh, I mean, you know, for a movie, especially a movie like this, where you're trying to kind of go back to exploitation films and slasher films and, and make it feel classic and, and a cult, like a cult vibe, um, you know, you kind of look for the, you know, things that naturally uh, raise eyebrows and, and cause disturbance. Um, and, you know, the two biggest being sex and religion. So when you put them together, it's just kind of a powder keg of, uh, of creative opportunity and things to do um, when telling a story. You know, I, it's kind of listed as a horror movie, but I took it almost more as a black comedy because of how over the top some of the both sexual and violent situations were. Was that the intent? A hundred percent, man. And I, I mean, honestly, thank you, because I, you know, a lot of people are like outraged and, you know, offended or like, I'll never watch this again. Um, but to me, it's it gets funnier every time you watch it. I mean, it is a comedy. I mean, Jeremy and I watch it. My wife watches it with me, and we hysterically laugh. Um, you know, there's times that, you know, you don't laugh because it's horrible things happening on screen. But, it, you know, there's a lot of humor in this movie to be laughed at if you'll let yourself. So I, I do look at it as a – it's got horror elements. It's got comedy elements. It's got drama elements. I mean, it's kind of uh, a, a smorgasbord of, of genre. So – uh, but definitely a lot of comedy. Yeah, no. Well, so you mentioned the feedback, and, you, and you've gotten some some negative feedback from people outraged. And yeah, I would warn you if you are, uh, you know, bashful to these type of movies, you're not familiar with like genre films like these, then you know you might want to you, you might want to not pick this one up. But if you adore this stuff, you're gonna have a good time. But what what are you hearing back from people? I looked on Rotten Tomatoes on like Friday, and this thing had like a ninety six percent. Yeah, I mean, I, I say that people are outraged, but they're outraged in the sense that they're like, I love this, but I'll never watch it again because it fucked me up. But then I'd say a majority of people, like we've had a lot of screenings and everybody comes out and is just in love with the movie. I mean, it's the best received movie I've ever had. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people go back to see it in the theater or rent it and watch it multiple times to, to get the laughs out of the second viewing. So the, the any any criticism or like, real vitriol has been very, very small. I mean, vast majority of people love this movie, and I, and I hope everybody gets a chance to watch it and, and let themselves enjoy it, so. What's your favorite story from the set while filming this? 
Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the guy um, who takes out, you know, the priest who visits uh, our Remy, um, our, our lead character, and um, is killed by him. Not to, or, I, I don't want to spoil anything. He, <laughs> sure. he passed away uh, not too long after the movie was filmed in real life. Wow. And, you know, this was kind of a dream of his to become an actor. He was a he was a doorman at a very famous music venue um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm from, called the Canes Ballroom. And he just got such a great look and energy and vibe about him that we started casting him in our movies. And uh, this was his first real, you know, the real role um, with a lot of juice in it. And uh, and he really just did so well as that priest. He's so creepy. And when he when he pulls out his teeth, um, you know, I didn't tell anybody he was going to do that, and nobody knew his teeth came out, and and the whole crew just died laughing and in disgust. And uh, it's one of those things that translates to, you know, an audience as well, where, you know, everybody really just has a good time once that happens in the film. Um, so I don't know, it just getting to work with him and, and kind of the memory of him getting to live on in this character is kind of my favorite thing about the film. So what's next? Are you going to do a sequel for this one, or, or what movie are you jumping onto after this? Uh, we've got one coming out um, February 3rd called Little Dixie. It's a uh, it's with Frank Grillo. It's a kind of a grindhouse um, action movie. It's a lot of fun. If you like nice this, and I, you'll like laugh at I like this, you'll laugh man. at that. Yeah, you'll, you'll love this movie then. Um, we've got another film uh, with J.K. Simmons and Frank coming out in the spring. And then, yeah, there is rumor about uh, – about Candyland too, which um, you know we'll we'll see if that happens. But um, I'd love to do it. So awesome! Well, where can people catch this film now? Where can they get Candyland at? Uh, you can watch it pretty much anywhere you rent or buy movies online or on your TV. So Apple, Amazon, Vudu, um, you know any of those platforms will have Candyland available for your viewing uh, pleasure. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. Don't be a stranger. Let me know next time you got a movie coming out. Happy to talk to you again. Dooner, you're the man. Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody out there, and, and thank you for the work you guys do. I appreciate it, John. Take care. All right, bye. All right, guys. Let's see. All right, you hearing about all that rain over in California? Well, meanwhile... Right, Sean Beckner, Car Mitchell. He says rain continued to pour down in Los Angeles. A manhole cover on Fountain in La Brea is rattling as water spews through holes on top. Man, when I used to live out in Hollywood, Fountain was like the secret street. You always took, you always took Fountain. Less cops on that street, a little bit of windy. I lived off it too. Good stuff. Well, hey, let's talk to our guys. Don't drown out there. I know we get a lot of you out in California, so be good. And I just saw those mudslide things came up again. They just had horrific mudslides a couple years ago, and uh, Santa Barbara County areas like that have been evacuated. So praise to all of you people out there. Chris Deal, Chief Technology Officer at T Force Worldwide. Love the hat, brother. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Are you are you a Brit? Nope. You studied in, did you study in England though? I did. I did. I was, cause I was looking at Correct. your LinkedIn. I was looking in your background. I was doing a little cyber uh -huh. stalking and I was trying to get a yep. good idea. Well, before we jump into things here, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, been kind of, uh, all around the place, um, been in logistics in and out for a while, been with T force, uh, now for, uh, not too long, only about six months, but, um, been involved in technology and really industries under change for the better part of two decades now, and uh, really excited about some of the things that are, are going on in this industry. Yeah, it's, it, you know, a lot of, lot of tech in the news race recently, especially in aviation, except these disruptions are not the kind you want in supply chain. No, they are not, not good ones. <laughs> what's good, yeah. though, we won't focus on the bad to start. What's special, unique about what's happening with uh, technology in the logistics industry now? We've got good news there? I think we can have some good news there. You know, there's, there's a possibility of maybe a cautionary tale, but, you know, when I look at, at our industry right now, it really feels a little bit like retail banking did maybe a generation or two ago where they had this really customer-focused, relationship-driven service play, and then it very rapidly changed this kind of cold and you know consolidated volume play. And 
that drove a lot of people away and made people really crabby and satisfaction started to go down, right? So we got these secondary markets coming out of that from things like self-directed investing. And I think worst case scenario, we could see something really similar, right? Because there's there's stuff going on that's driving depersonalization of, of the industry, whether that's you know, governance and compliance, whether that's you know, consumer protection or, or data privacy, there's the sexy stuff like the self-driving trucks, you know, there's just simple cost things like automation and connectivity, but the common thread is that they're taking people out of the equation. Mm. And that can be great, right? It, it could be fantastic because we can redeploy capital in more interesting ways, but it could be really dangerous. Because once experts are out of the picture, once people aren't necessary, you can see that commodity play that turns into more of a self-directed on-demand thing. Uh, you know, for tech, I, I think a lot of the value comes right now in data-driven decision making and, and you know more complex and responsive uh, advancements like rate generation, communication between your shippers, brokers, insurers, carriers, the rolling stock, and even sometimes the, the loads themselves. And, and that's pretty exciting, although there's not a great standard yet for, for that across the industry, although I'd say demand is rising. So uh, that and automation, you know, automating payments and warehouses and carrier communication and claims and even the operation of the vehicle, right? Self-driving trucks are, are a big thing. And you know, there's just changes coming from every direction. So you, it's you, not I mean, really clear yet what's going to be the thing that sticks. But I, you make a good point. Disruption. You make a go. I mean, one thing that is very in vogue right now is ChatGPT, right? Everyone is like, oh, look, it wrote an article for me or it summarized this or it wrote some code. And it's great. Yeah. I, you, and, and I love tech. I don't want to sound like a tech hater, but there's also like a very sort of cautionary thing going on. And I sit there very weary because where's the oversight? Where's the accountability? With humans, you still have that. And that's been a concern, especially in freight. When you have the uh, tech weary or the tech haters, they always say, ah, tech yeah. schmack, you know, this is a business of relationships. And I think the tech side says, of course, it is but we need to augment those relationships with tech so how do you do that how do you augment those relationships in 2023 yeah you know i i absolutely agree with you and i think that you know the companies that are going to to grow and thrive are, are the ones that find those ways to to use the tech to support the relationships and to augment them you know what we're seeing uh, one good example is you know, an increase in an ability to provide advisory services, you know, to customers based on data that we're bringing in and analytics that we're able to perform, that helps them come up with the right distribution schedules and carrier selection and you know, even the shipment methods that are going to give them the best outcomes, as opposed to just a, a rate calculator somewhere. And tech is enabling that, but it's not replacing that relationship. And it, it goes across a few different angles. You know, similarly, I can use automation to drive down costs and eliminate human error. And that's that's cool, right? We should do that. That's fine. But once your business processes and your kind of core operations are automated, you have an opportunity, and I would say almost a responsibility, to start offering more customization, more options than you could reasonably support at a reasonable cost when everything was manual. Right? That puts the customers back in control, and it doesn't add a lot of overhead. And I don't know, maybe one more thing is integrations, right? I mean, everybody wants to talk about you know hooking systems together, and that's fine. Uh, I really think that the days of the monolithic TMS are coming to a close. And the exciting part there is that you don't have to be limited by the features of a single system. If you're leveraging those relationships, if you're talking to carriers and partners to figure out what they want, you can use integration and development to get those right solutions and hook them all together like Legos and really provide more than you could buy from any one person. Yeah, now you're speaking my language, interlocking bricks. Let's say I'm a uh, let's say I'm a large three PL. I'm T E Dooner, this the largest three PL in America. Ooh. What sh what should I be thinking about when I'm investing in tech right now? You know, I think that it comes down to 
what your play in it really is. You know, for me, when I think about T-Force Worldwide, you know, I say we're in the business of making promises and keeping promises. No, no matter how much I'd like it to be the case, we're not in the business of selling software. And I think that that's true for you know, even hypothetical large 3PLs. You know, it's, it's no secret I'm a tech guy. I, I love software. I love building software. But long-term investment in R&D in a low-margin industry is super difficult unless you're going to change your core business. And I think that we want logistics companies to do logistics. We don't want them to be concerned with software sales and capitalization. So that's an important thing is becoming a good consumer of technology. It, even if you wanted to go whole hog and, you know, capability development, I would say that it's the wrong time because there's so much change out there. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. If you were to go say, especially with the price of eggs right now, Chris, what's that? Especially with the cost of a dozen eggs right now. That. Absolutely. They're not getting any cheaper. No. I'll trade you a catalytic no. converter for some. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, Chris, I mean, Chris, Chris, I got one last question because I want to know how you think. And sure. I was looking I was looking in your bio and it said you find ways to overcome technology shortcomings in other industries, often in surprising ways. What is a surprising way or a way you even surprised yourself when you're overcoming one of those? Yeah. You know, I, I think to me, one of the surprising things that you can look at there is a lot of people are, are looking at capability development and solutions as either buy versus build, right? And, and you need to do one or the other. And I think that for a lot of mid-market and uh, non-tech you know, driven companies, it's really a, a combination play of uh, what I would consider orchestration and integration. And it, it has a trade-off of, well, all of a sudden you might say, guy, that's going to drive up ops costs if I buy a whole bunch of systems. But that drives the innovation of driving down costs with automation. And so finding that balance of how many features can I add versus how much automation and internal improvements do I have to do in order to justify that cost to deliver the value at a sustainable price. I think that leads to some interesting decision-making that is typically not considered from a, uh, a tech guy. I hear you, Chris. Chris, where do people go to learn more? Where do they connect with T-Force? Well, obviously we've, we've got our, our website out there and uh, I invite everybody to, uh, to connect with us there. Uh, the Connect platform, which is, you know, our integration platform is connect.tfwwi.com and cool. uh, of course you can find us on linkedin and all of your your favorite channels there as well well hey thanks for stopping by the show we appreciate your time today absolutely thanks a lot take care all right Yep. Time to tip the band. Do you remember we mentioned AIT's Global Transportation Market Report earlier in the show? Capacity and pricing trends, air, ocean, and trucking, economic insights, extra, et cetera. Well, what do you do once you have that useful data and analysis? You turn insights into action, right? Partner with AIT's global network of subject matter experts, and they'll design a supply chain solution tailored to your needs. Get started today at AIT Worldwide. Com. Now it's time for the lovely Rachel Premack. She's the editorial director over at Freight Waves. And um, weird morning, Rachel woke up to uh, woke up to all the planes being grounded in the United States of America. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the aviation beat. I I definitely don't envy, or maybe I do envy aviation reporters right now because it's it's been a crazy year, and it's only January 11th. So, um, yeah. <laughs> when Pete, Pete are... just got done dressing down Southwest, right? Just yesterday, he posted, like, Southwest has to do all these reparations, $3,500, like this big, long Twitter thread about it, and then this morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What seems to happen, to be fair, the FAA is a far smaller issue than what Southwest uh, faced. Uh, their uh, notice to air emissions system was down from about 7 to 9 a.m., or rather uh, they stopped, uh, they closed down um, domestic flights from 7 to 9 a.m. 
the system closed down, I think, a few hours before that. Um, and now things are back up and running, but we still saw thousands of flights getting canceled and almost a thousand flights, or sorry, thousands of flights getting delayed and almost a thousand flights getting canceled. So definitely a rough morning if you happen to have a flight uh, today. Interesting. So any impact, I mean, today it was really scary when you first hear this. Fortunately, by like 930, I think they had the system back up online. So we're only talking about a few hours of downtime. Any uh, other than like a million calls at all the brokerages across America, any other disruptions to freight by panic shippers? I'm sure just because, uh, you know, as we know in the supply chain, one sort of cancellation can or one sort of issue can cause a ripple effect where you have one thing getting pushed off and that next thing getting pushed off and so on and so forth. So I could definitely see some issues in the air cargo world just from these two hours of of delays just because as we know air cargo isn't just flying in cargo planes it's also flying in the belly of those passenger planes so definitely likely that we saw some minor sort of ripples and disruptions uh that i'm sure some freight forwarders are dealing with as we speak the employment dominoes are falling down left and right, Rachel. We had Amazon with, what, 18,000 workers. Salesforce had, like, 10,000. There's been a bunch. And just a few minutes ago, it was announced that Flexport had another big layoff. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so we've been seeing, speaking of freight forwarders, we've been seeing uh, lots of logistics companies uh, have to announce layoffs in the past few months. And Flexport announced today that's laying off about 700 people, which is equal to around 20% of its global workforce. So pretty big layoff. They're saying uh, the slowdown in global trade and also having more automated systems, that means that they can uh they need to and can uh, reduce their total employment number. Um, so, yeah, it seems like it's both as a result of these macro uh, macro conditions as well as they manage to automate it enough that they don't need as many people. I kind of get the impression through the size of these firings that a lot of companies, sure, there's economic headwinds, but a lot of companies are just using it as a, as a good time to, to correct. They're using it as a smokescreen. Anytime the big guys drop a bomb, too, it becomes easier and easier to start throwing people out of the boat. Um, for those of you under these bigger companies and down, a little concerning out there for uh, for all of us. I guess the one good news, Rachel, is like, isn't unemployment still like 4%? So, I mean, if they throw you out of the boat, maybe there's another job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I believe that uh, companies are still really looking to hire people, Um it's kind of funny in on the journalism side monday and the monday monday and last tuesday like the start of the weeks uh the past two weeks every single person i seem to follow announced that they had a new job so i even in journalism if they're hiring people that's usually a good sign for the rest of the economy because usually journalism's the area that's struggling the most so um yeah i i guess if journalism's doing okay maybe other areas are doing okay but just as a in a zoomed out kind of way, it does seem like a lot of these really big companies are having huge uh, employment cuts. And my sense is that uh, maybe they hired too much too quickly. They grew too quickly. Um, a lot of places had unusually high demand uh, from 2020 through 2021. And now they've really just got to uh, cut back a bit. After massively growing up until the past two years in terms, I, I believe they topped at like 1.65 million employees, that was Amazon, they've since reduced quite a bit over the over these past two years. Do you think that will remain their peak was at 1.65 million? Can we think about automation, you think about hiring, do you think they ever get to that size staff again? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, they there are still countries and markets that they haven't expanded to, so I could see them maybe expand as they expand to new countries, new regions, um, perhaps they will need to expand their employment for that reason. But I, I do agree with you. If they continue to automate, which they will, as they continue to automate, there will be less of a demand for these employees. And I think 2021 was probably the peak of like a lot buying a bunch of stuff online i think it but on the other hand i'm kind of like working through this in my head on the other hand um most 
retail, most purchases are still made in person. I forget the exact number, but it's kind of surprising. Uh, still, the majority of purchases are made in person, not online. So I think especially as grocery delivery and those sorts of uh Th those types of online ordering and online retail grows. I could I could even see Amazon uh, blowing past that 1.6 million mark, um, just as especially I think online ordering for groceries uh, continues to grow and grows into other regions. I love delivery. I mean, I only I only get online delivery more and more because I mean, ironically enough, for someone who has a very social job like this, talking to people all the time, I have wicked bad social anxiety. Like like just strangers going there. Oh, I don't know. I just I just I prefer like you know like when DoorDash comes to the door, I'm like army crawling, peeking out like the side of the window. I don't want it's to like. like yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know the feeling. I think like our, our like, especially anyone younger than me, we've all kind of been like socially ruined. I don't know if the pandemic, yeah. if the pandemic helped very much. Well, one other trend line, and I know you're, you're covering in this, this may be in the next modes is, uh, can you just touch a little bit on the trans supply chain finance transparency? What's going on there? Cause money is going to be an issue this year. Yeah, it's a really, it's kind of a niche accounting situation that uh, our uh, Marcus editor, Todd Maiden, wrote about this weekend, but I'm going to take another look into it for modes uh, tomorrow. What's going on is that there's this uh, accounting tool that big companies can use in order to uh, delay when they pay their suppliers. So let's say you're Walmart, you have a payment out to... I don't know, Joe's Apple Farm, uh, and you have a 60-day payment, uh, but Joe's Apple Farm wants it on day five. Uh, through working with a bank, Walmart can offer uh, payment on day five, even if they only pay off that bill on day 60. And it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting um, tool, basically, for large companies to improve their cash flow, still get the uh, money to suppliers uh, in a timely fashion. On the other hand, if a supplier does take out the um, the payment earlier than that day 60 mark, they do uh, see a slight penalty in, uh, in the payment. So it's also called reverse factoring. Um, and yeah, starting this month, as we see quarterly earnings come out, we will see uh, the scale at which these companies are using supply chain financing, and it could even expose a few red flags uh, for companies that might be over reliant on this tool in order to improve cash flow. Oh, I'm excited to learn more. I'll have to subscribe to Modes. I have a question, by the way. We started the show talking to the director of the new truck stop movie, Candyland. Have you uh, rented that one yet? I have not. Where, what, I. Uh, like video on demand you can just go on like apple tv or prime or whatever like any cool. video streaming yeah you can rent it on there you, you have to rent right, it right cool. now it'll be on like netflix one of these days i bet what about oh do you have, yeah yeah well here's one for you this is one that is right up your alley i saw this movie last night it's called the menu it's on hbo have you saw, have you seen it yet i've heard a lot about it i see people keep tweeting about it i don't know what it is I thought people were just talking about like a menu when I first yeah. saw tweets about this. I'm like, what is the menu? But no, I have not. Should I, do you recommend it? I do. I thought it was going to be like some pretentious, like foodie tasting movie, but not, it's not. It's a black comedy skewering that. It's sort of like if you took the movie Chef and combined it with, with Hostel, but like it, you added some humor too. It's not like total torture porn. It's, okay. it's done, it's done really well, That's but fun. it's, uh, it does have a, um, and the twist happens so early on in the movie, uh, uh, that, you know, they, they go to this island and yeah, it, things go awry. Have but you seen Megan? I haven't yet, but I've seen Small Wonder when I was a kid in the 80s. It seems like this, it seems like I, they ripped no, off Small Wonder. Say, my parents say this is just Tiny Tina, the remake, but I think it was really good. It was really good. So I recommend it. It was saw. funny. What'd you say? So that's what you went. On. So Megan, okay, yeah, I do want. I'm, like, I'm a child's play yeah. fan, so I will. I will go see that. I wish that my soul was uh, inside a demonic doll. Sometimes <laughs> be easier to take care of. It my seems kind of convenient to have a demonic doll. To it kind of seems like Chat GPT in some way. 
you know, when my kid, so my, my, my son Sebastian, when he was five, he watched the Goosebumps movie and he learned of this character, Slappy. And he got so obsessed with Slappy and he like really wanted a Slappy dummy. So I had to go all over eBay and I finally found him a Slappy dummy and I gave it to him. And then like two weeks after having it, he got like, he should have absolutely frightened of the doll. And now he made me like go and bury it somewhere. So there's a Slappy buried somewhere in the woods of Chattanooga. If you want, maybe I'll turn it into like, a, like a, an ARG game or something. You guys out there can go and find it at the next F3. That sounds go like the beginning of a horror movie. Like, it really does. <laughs> Blackie comes back to life and from the ground, and that, I don't know. That's gonna I'm, be I'm my collaboration. That'll be my collaboration with that director, John Swab of Candyland. We'll have, uh, we'll, someone here will dig up Slappy and they'll bring him over to F3, and then there'll be like a massive slasher murder over at the conference. Next week when we're all in Chattanooga, I think we should figure out. I'm I'm gonna make sure I don't go near that woods for oh, sure. Oh yeah, stay away from the woods. Um, They're haunted woods. But you know what you can't stay away from? You can't stay away from trivia, Rachel. And uh, I went younger. I went younger this time. I went okay. down to Generation Z. And I think you okay. might know this one. That's it still, is trends. You may have leapfrog mine, but we'll see. No, I, no, no. I you are remember. a you are a trendsetter. I've seen you use this term before, and I think it's right in your okay. wheelhouse. When someone adds the phrase, no cap, to their sentence, what are they saying? They're saying, like, I'm being serious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Rachel! There's the comeback we needed today! She's back on the See, board! I mean, back to her gotta winning ways! You do the millennial Gen Z. Gen X, it's not gonna work. Yeah. It's not gonna work. Yeah, a little too crusty for you. It's for Crypt Keepers like me and these next guys coming up. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. Everyone go subscribe to Modes. We appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. Take it easy. All right, we got Rooster. <laughs> we <laughs> there we go. And Super Trucker. <laughs> I'm just going to use that sound effect for you until you give me one of your own, Justin. Sure, thanks. What, what, do, you, what do you think you need, a horn? Better than two cars crashing into each other. That's true. That's true. Justin, or Rooster, let me ask you first. Did you watch... Candyland yet. I know you wrote a preview on backthetruckup.com. I've been up your ass about it, but I'm not sure if you actually did. I have not gotten through all of it yet. I tried to watch some of it last night, but got the uh, got uh, distracted by some other stuff around the house. But uh, so far, you know, it, it, it's up there with the, the good truck stop movies. You know, it, it's it, you got to have your taste in it, but yeah, it's you just know, a, yeah. we need to see more we need to see more truck stop movies, you know. It's been why about 20, 30 years since the smoking the bandit and uh Monster. There's there's this monster truck movie called Monster Man where Monster Man, you ever see Monster Man? He drives around killing people. It's kind of a rip-off of Joyride. Right. Justin, I don't think you even watched Candyland, did you? I haven't seen it yet. It, my son's always in the room, so we're not putting yeah, that no, on the TV. They're disturbing. You no, know what is like, you no, know what is the my favorite thing that I've bought for myself is just like Bluetooth headphones for the couch. Because my boys mm. are six and eight, and I like to listen to things loud at night. So I got like the Sony Pulse headphones. They connect right to the PS5, no connection or anything. Once the kids go to bed, I throw those on. I can watch the most disturbing content as loud as I want. And it's just. It's just bliss, boys. Well, there is a very serious side to this. That was a black comedy that uh, that looked at actually an aspect of human trafficking. I mean, sex work is an aspect of human trafficking. Today is National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And to it's weird to say, like, celebrate, right? Like, yay! To, yeah. Like, not to celebrate, but I guess to commemorate, you guys spoke with C CVSA, right, about their Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Tell us a little bit about the issue and what you guys learned. Justin, let's start with you. Yeah, so basically anyone can be a victim. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, the sex workers that you see at the truck stop parking lot. It can be, you know, middle income or upper middle income families that, uh, you know, pimp their kids out online. Um, it was a really heavy topic. And um, my main goal with talking with them was to find out what are the signs of human trafficking, you know, things that drivers can be looking out for that you don't necessarily notice at first glance. What, and what then the steps you can take. Um, so... Things like control, you know, if you're in line at the truck stop and you see somebody put something on the counter for someone else to pay for them, that's a sign of, you know, human trafficking. Um, vehicles that aren't where they're supposed to be. So we can't stand RVs parking in truck stop parking lots, but that's, you know, that can be a sign of human trafficking. RVs? Um, they have cases. Where, yes, they have cases where, you know, somebody has a, a victim in the RV and they have an ad online. Um, uh, Kayla called it a, she called it a truck stop special. 
Um, yeah. That's really what they call them. Um, Wait, so yeah, it's it like was, a pimp. It it's like a it's like a pimp human trafficker like bus, and then yeah, the, the yeah. women are inside. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the um, you know we professionally use the term lot lizard, but she was. I asked her like, what are the numbers that you think? You know, if you see somebody out there what's the ratio of somebody who's out there for themselves versus somebody who's being trafficked? And she says like the, the study she cited, it's like up, up in the uh, higher 90%. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Rooster, what did you learn during this conversation? Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately it's very disproportionate toward women, uh, men and children also trafficked for, you know, uh, labor for, uh, commercial sex, uh, you know, uh, Finding these red flags is very important. You know, like Justin said, uh, people not coming home at night, uh, seeing new tattoos on people, uh, bouts of crying, depression, exhaustion, of uh, having too many unknown adults or on your social media. On social media, could be a, a part of it. Uh, the problem is human trafficking. There's a lot of money involved in it. it's fifteen and a half billion dollars. Uh, it, you know, it is horrifying to see that, you know, there's 20 to 40 million people around the world that's trafficked right now. Uh, it, it's not something you really want to talk about out in the open, but we got, we have to start taking, yeah. looking at this. It's a scourge. It's a scourge in the logistics industry with human trafficking, you know, and the conversation we had with uh, Kyle Lanier from Truckers Gets Trafficking and Jake Elev. Elvira with uh, CVSA. Uh, it, it was a lot of information they brought to us about this, you know, and how this affects people's lives, as, especially those 18 and older, uh, 18 and younger, uh, coming in from foreign countries. You know, you always see it on the news, the, everybody coming in across the Texas Arizona border. I mean, a lot of those people are being trafficked. Interesting. Uh, well, J Justin, uh, what can the, we? What do they tell you about? How can you do? Like, what can a charge driver do? How, like, what do you do if you see this occurring? She said, if you, if you see something and you absolutely know it's a crime, call nine one one. She's like, just right off the bat, call nine one one. Don't say you think it's prostitution. Say you think it's human trafficking. Like that's step number one. If you have um, any suspicions, you know they they um, said contact truckers against trafficking. Uh, they gave us their. Um, 1-800, of course, I don't have it on me right now. It's their 1-800 yeah. number. It's in the, it's sure. in the podcast notes. Um, it says Virginia Trucking uh, uh, Association says 140 cases of human trafficking were identified in Virginia in 2021 involving 179 victims. And I got to say, that's probably not even scratching like the surface, right? That's just no. not what they found. No, the not, but, not close. Yeah, most, are, most of these bad guys are going right through the colander, right? Like you're, you're not catching yeah. much of anything. Yeah, and I asked her, like, how much has social media played you know, into, into all this these days. Yeah. And she said it's heavily, heavily, you know, dating sites um, are like oh, heavy sure. sources of human trafficking. A lot of it is just, you know, nowadays every kid has a phone in their pocket. You know, that's how a lot of these victims end up uh, coming into contact with the traffickers uh, from the get go. Well, Hey, they, they talk all about this on today's back the truck up podcast. Go look that up wherever you get your podcast in obviously a uh, very serious issue. I believe something like 40 million people are, Still in slavery around the world, and uh, that's only getting worse. I mean, if you look at cobalt mines and yeah. stuff, it seems like we're just offshoring slavery and looking the other way. But uh, that's a topic for another day. Uh, boys, you ever have this one happen to you? Look at what happened to this person's Tesla. You know how rainy it is out in California. Someone's trying to get home <laughs> through the rain, and they got their Tesla even more wet. This is from Passing a Fire Department. PFD and PPD were on the scene of the 700 block in West California. A Tesla driver hit the accelerator instead of the brake, and he drove straight through a wall and into the pool. Inside the car, he had uh, another adult and a child. You guys ever do anything this stupid? You ever hit the gas instead of the brake? I've never mixed up the pedals before. I, I may have like slipped my foot off the clutch and you know grabbed a gear by accident, but never uh, never mixed up the pedals before. Rooster, what about you? You, you? I think they should revoke your CDL if you've messed those two up. Yeah, it, it, it unfortunately does happen. You know, you see those pictures of people going off the edge of the rest area and down the hill, but you know, I've, it, it's it's kind of kind of rough you know and you also you know you don't want something like this to happen and especially with you know children involved with it you know you don't want them to uh get injured or you know possibly you know lose their life and uh all right stop being like so this. serious rooster it's a great picture should they keep it in the pool or not 
Ruth, Justin, how about you? Would you keep that in the pool? Stop being all somber on me, Rooster. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I don't want to know how they get it out of there. You know, they're going to have to get a crane, not just not just a uh, a tow truck. I would think to so too. Scoop that out of there. You know, I grew up in South Florida, so this stuff happens more than you think. You know, elderly elderly people they they mix the pedals up and they smash into Starbucks. That's that's probably like a monthly occurrence in South Florida. Ah, well, how about here? Look, here's something you could probably prevent if you're not an idiot. And I don't think we've sent you out to start dancing on the side of the road. Look at this clip right now and tell me why this is a Ugh. stupid way to make a TikTok. We got these so ladies cool. dancing I mean, right here in the that. Look how close that is. It almost blew her wig off. By inches. And that, so first of all, that driver probably wasn't paying attention, which is why he drifted out of the lanes. And if he hit them, he probably wouldn't have even felt it. You know, just that the weight of the vehicle versus a human body, you, the, the truck's not even going to flinch. Ooh, you ever buzz the tower on someone that close by accident, uh, Rooster? Uh, no, I haven't done it, done it like that. You know, uh, over in Connecticut, the one of the interstates over there, the lanes were so close that we were hitting mirrors, but, you know, not purposely tipping to run somebody over. I mean, this is like we've interviewed several people who have who have hit someone while they've been driving a truck. Right. I mean, this is it is absolutely devastating to the psychology of many of these drivers yeah. when this happens. Like, you're not just going to lose your life, but you're going to mess someone else's life up, too. Like, there, there's no this is stupid. Use a green screen if you want to dance like that. Yeah. But you know, TikTok, TikTok's well, on TikTok TikTok is. I don't know. You think they're gonna ban? Do you guys think they're gonna ban the TikTok? Uh, no. It's it's the, the genie's hard. out of the bottle at this point. It's Can't put the, the, too many people using it. Can you, ro ro Rooster? Can you put the toothpaste back in the tube? Have you figured out a method yet? Uh, we need to check Nancy Pelosi's stock holdings. See how much Instagram she's holding. You know, that's the major competitor to TikTok. So if she's holding a big chunk of Instagram, I would be worried. Wouldn't that be Meta? I don't know. They're not doing too well either. Um, anyways, let's take a look at this one. Here's a mistake maybe you two guys could have made. You know how it is. You're driving down the road. Car comes out of nowhere. Roll this tape. WVLT8 reports that this was in near us, Everville, Tennessee. A semi-truck crashed into a yard at that home on Snap Road. Home security footage rings. They are uh, the greatest blessing ever to content creators. According to a report from Tennessee Highway Patrol, that 2015 freight liner driven by, driven by Brent Waldrop was traveling westbound. Well, Tacoma was covered coming the other way, driven by Michael McGorick. Uh, this guy tries to avoid him, and he ends up going all the way through this person's yard fortunately nobody was injured although that like that hit every branch on the ugly tree on the way down as he goes off off the side there my question to you guys is that looked like a pretty long drive why wasn't he able to stop in time the way that trailer's bounced it looks like it was empty plus he's on grass so your, your tire is going to lock up um he did a pretty good job threading the needle between those trees but you know that that drop off was there waiting for waiting to catch him hmm hmm Exciting stuff. Rooster, you ever have a close call like that? What is the biggest jump you've ever taken on a rig with a trailer over? Uh, pretty big speed bumps, but never nothing like that. Uh, according to what I could find out about the situation, if you notice the road, it's kind of fresh. The road was, I believe, being paved at that time. And when that coma came in, it was uh, not enough room on the road for the truck. So he, the mm. uh, Southeast Freightline truck, went off the road momentarily driver overcorrected to get back into the lane yeah. and that caused him to uh, slide on that wet, fresh asphalt into the yard and uh, off the edge of the driveway there mm. interesting what do you guys think saudi arabia are they gonna buy the wwe stephanie mcmahon resigned yesterday is she paving way is she parting the seas here's her resignation letter i think we have that one guys what do you think guys you know, it's just sad. It's an American institution. It's always been a small family company. I have no idea what uh, the Saudi investment firm is going to turn it into going forward. Interesting. Okay, what about you? Do you have an opinion? Do you have an opinion, Rooster? <laughs> not, not. A, I don't know. Uh, Rooster, you got an opinion? <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see. A lot of people hate the, the Saudi Arabia investment firm because of the the ties to human rights violations and yeah. The, the Sakogi killing earlier sure. uh, a couple of years back. Uh, it, it's if Triple H and Stephanie McMahon want to start their own uh, wrestling company, they have the money, they have the capability to do so. WWE's been around for 70 years. The question is, are they selling it to Saudi Arabia? 
Yes or no? Don't don't know yet, but I I hope not. I hope not too. I hope not too. Big new it would be good for AEW. I don't know what that would do for WWE. Hey, thank you guys for joining us. I got to throw a promo out here for sales and marketing. Go check those guys up on backthetruckup.com. See you later, boys. Uh, check it out. Sales and marketing summit coming up. Sales and marketing summit is coming up. See you later, guys. Sales and mar see you later, guys. Sales and marketing. See you later, guys. Sales and marketing summit is coming up. Let's uh, roll the tape. Mario, you know we're not together anymore. Well, wait, y'all know each other? Here we go. What, what are you talking about? Oh, oh man. Yeah, this has kind of been a violent show. I can't wait. Sales and Marketing Summit comes up tomorrow. We got a What the Truck from there around noon. I got an awesome panel with uh, Boris Panov. I got uh, I got Paul from Freight Caviar. We got Mario Pangini from Store, plus some extra special guests. Got a lot of free ways to come, so register. Don't be strange and take it easy. Like F3, move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June.